Hello, so I've still not actually figured out like a proper introduction for this. Um, I'm really excited about this episode. This is, I think, Fraser, I think I messaged your business page. I didn't look back. I meant to look back. I think it was like three, maybe four years ago. I think it was maybe around the time that your, your big video came out, which we'll touch on in a minute. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it could be three or four years, actually. Yeah, it could be a while back now. Yeah. So... Like everybody or anybody that doesn't know, I'm Thomas. Uh, this is going to be what's going to be called the Man Podcast, which is muscles and nonsense. Um, we will talk about muscles and then a lot of nonsense. People that know me know I waffle, but I'm going to try and make this like I'm going to try and let you, Fraser, talk as much as possible. Uh, again, I'm really excited about this episode and almost slightly starstruck, Fraser, because your YouTube video <laughs> that's pretty big, I have watched a lot of times. I've spoke with counsellors and I've used a lot of the things that you've said in that as arguments to why what they're trying to just continually push isn't maybe the best thing. Mm. Um, and I'm really excited to just kind of riff. I'm excited to find out what you think. Absolutely. I'm excited to find out about what we can do. So if you could give a little introduction on yourself, that would be fantastic. Sure. Well, first of all, thanks so much. I think it's the first time that anybody's described my company as being starstruck. So I'm going to get that <laughs> written down somewhere. Um <laughs> Yeah, no, so yeah, I'm a, a counselling psychologist, a um, couple of years graduated now. I um, I work, I, so I, I suppose the best description of me is that I'm uh, I'm the kind of clinical director and counselling psychologist of Psychology Scotland, which is a private therapy clinic. We do one-to-one -one mental health work for all demographics. Um, and we do a lot of kind of corporate work as well. So we do got a lot of contracts with organizations where we provide third party, third party mental health support through therapy, workshops, webinars, uh, drop-in clinics. We do a bunch of other things as well for a number of different companies, uh, uh, Scotland wide really. So that's been in operation now about 18 months. Um, out with that, I, um, I kind of had a, a, a platform, Thomas, you might have kind of Know, seen some of the content through that which was uh, which was get site that was like a kind of online platform youtube channel website blog social media platform and that was that was a platform that i kind of ran during my dog trip starting in about 2017 ran that for a few years up until quite recently really when i started psychology scotland and that was just an opportunity for me to kind of communicate mental health content uh, psychology training content and and that that did quite well and um, went to a number of different conferences internationally got opportunities to speak the tedx talk in glasgow on kind of male identity which i think you, you've kind of accessed on so that's that's that'll be a main theme of today as well so yeah that's kind of me out with that i'm um a dad uh a husband and that takes up the majority of my time out with work <laughs> yeah i like how you played that down so much that tedx talk because that <laughs> it's massive it's had seventy thousand views it was from back in 2019 yeah. I don't know if you know as well, because I watched it again this morning, because what I didn't want to do is I didn't want to sound like I was just stuck in an echo chamber or I was just like repeating everything that you said, because I do like, <laughs> and do I that. don't know if maybe that's why I was so drawn to it, but like everything that you said and I agreed with. I don't know if yeah. you know, so people are still commenting on it. People are still watching. Yeah, I mean, they, that it's funny you say that, because actually a couple of weeks ago, somebody mentioned that to me, and I kind of checked that out, and uh, I checked out some of the comments. It's, it's, these kind of things are so interesting. I kind of had those, I got lots of comments on like videos and get sites as well, and you get a mad wide array of different perspectives and different people saying different things. It's very interesting, actually, the comments. Yeah, yeah. I had, a, I had a quick read through some, but some of them, some of them are mega heartfelt. Like some of them were like... Yeah. Gulp in the throat and absolutely. I mean, it's it's interesting because those those kind of like those videos are really at times, and I, we found this on kind of the get site videos as well. They're kind of like online platforms for people to seek help and support, you know. And, and there's a lot of times that people who are in need, kind of mentally, emotionally, seek that kind of support through online content, more so video right now. So yeah, I'm kind of not surprised that there's a lot of really heartfelt stuff in there. You see that in the comments quite a bit. Right, honestly. That video, I genuinely love that video, and I think more people should watch it. And I will be tagging it. I'll like link it below. Um, but like you mentioned there as well, and just before we jumped on, we'll kind of touch on a couple of things because I think it's just like a good, uh, like background story so people understand like how we know one another and whatnot. But one of the questions yeah. before, I, in case I do forget, someone actually came through on Instagram asking if you are, if you do still take on patients, clients. Um, and what I'll do is I will, yeah. I will be linking like Instagram, social medias and website below as well. Is yeah, absolutely. I mean, just to kind of tag into that, it's really easy for people to reach out to us. Like, um, 
if they go to the website, there's an inquiry form they can fill out and um, it's really accessible. We've got an appointments team, a bookings team. So yeah, by all means. Right, perfect. Because that was like a question that came through and I didn't want to not ask that. So I've got that out of the way. So of course. <laughs> for people that again, like, so the, the way me and Fraser know each other, we played basketball. I think we played like one season because you're a year younger than me, aren't you? Yeah, that's right. I mean, you're younger than you. So I think we played, because I am I actually think the kind of games that we played against each other were maybe quite limited in reality. So I think we played a couple yeah. of games against each other, though. I, de- I definitely remember playing our both and you've been on the team. Yeah. You managed to get on the Scotland squad, though, right? I, yeah, I did. That was a while ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was a while ago. That was I'm, talk, I'm talking like 17, 18, maybe 15, like 15, 18 yeah. years ago. I never got on because of yeah. my attitude. And again, I don't believe. <laughs> skill wise, like, skill wise. Well, that's what I think I tell myself. I'm like, oh yeah, it was your attitude, Tom. <laughs> but maybe I was just crap. <laughs> but I never made the Scotland squad. What and then? Small world, pretty cool story as well. Is we both done. It was called an educational exchange, right? Oh, I think I've lost you. <laughs> so. First technical glitch. There's obviously going to happen. Um, we just got disconnected there, which is it is what it is. But Fraser, I don't know where you heard me get cut off. Like we both done a was it called was it called an educational exchange? But nobody came here. Yeah, it, th- that's kind of how they marketed it. It was like an exchange program, but there wasn't like a kind of an exchange. <laughs> it was more a case of like we went out there. there I think it was like a program by which um, host parents and schools like selected people. It was kind of like a weird process. I yeah. yeah, it was. Probably one of the best years. Are we cut off again? No, I've got you. I've got you. All right, perfect. Uh, probably one of the best years of my life. I absolutely loved it. Um, yeah. But small world, me and Fraser both ended up going to the same school. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> we did. And we were talking You're just before said, we yeah. came on camera. <laughs> yeah, I was there and then Fraser went. And then I think I either went back to visit either the following year or two years later. And when I went back, everyone was like, oh, you should have met Fraser the Scottish boy. I'm sure you know him, though, because they all think Scotland's like a blip. Yeah. He's so nice. And I was like, well, fucking thanks very much. What about me? They, they, they talked you up big time when I was there. You were there the year before me. So I, I was chasing your shadow, man. <laughs> yeah, no, that's not a very big shadow. But yeah, small world. So that's kind of like another thing to add to this. That's like, I just think it's like a nice part. Like, oh, yeah. Nice story, I suppose, to just add a bit of content. Yeah, absolutely. About, about the absolutely, yeah. But yeah. we really, like, I really do have, like, a, I wouldn't go as far as saying obsession. Fascination. I'm very interested mm. with male mental health, male, and I don't know if you know about myself as well. Like, the reason I became a personal trainer was because I was diagnosed with depression, actually, not long after coming back from America. My whole life had been, yeah. I'm going to play basketball, I'm going to play basketball. I went across and I came back, and then everyone was the same. Just slipped into that typical hole of, like, drink drugs chasing girls every weekend no yeah. ambition or anything diagnosed with depression the yeah. doctor said to me he was like you should start exercising again and i can remember being like you the reason i'm here is because of basketball basketball's made me depressed <laughs> and he's like no no go back and i started playing basketball yeah. again and i started feeling better pretty quick yeah. so i then was like right i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna become a personal trainer and i'm gonna try and get people to yeah. feel better yeah so that's where like my mental like uh, part of the mental health comes from but i don't also don't know yeah. if you know like small town well you'll know the the numbers and the stats better than me but we live in a small town called Arbroath and over the past few years there's like a big story of a young lad killing himself like it's 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 almost it's just unbelievable I mean yeah like do you know I I live in in Glasgow obviously bigger city but like you know and we and we hear the stories in in neighborhoods that I live in even of recent uh, situations of the gym I went to or, or still go to young guys who take their own lives in that kind of you know escalate so quickly it just sometimes it feels like it comes out of nowhere and i can see like you know in, in smaller villages that can that can make bigger waves as well i think just like kind of what you were saying to thomas like it's really interesting to hear you talk about like um your basketball career and your own mental health is for me that was that was also the case when i came back from the states i am um, i went through a, a real bout of depression as well and it was a lot a lot of that was connected to basketball which was for me, like, and you'll be in the same, you know what it's like in, in Scotland when you play basketball, it becomes a part of your identity. And um, I went to the States hoping to come back and, you know, maybe looking at, you know, could I, could I go pro? Could I go play with the Rocks? Could I progress my career in the national team? 
and I played well when I was in the States and came back and then it just kind of disintegrated from there and it really kind of led into a depressive phase for me so it's really interesting how our stories align and then yeah, crazy. you know kind of connected to a really interesting you know the, my my passion in mental mental health as well yeah so i guess that kind of like and i i i don't know like myself personally i don't know like i know that suicide rates are increasing is there more yeah. and more cases of men coming forward with mental health or is it still quite it's in a, in a broad sense that there's some really interesting information around it because in reality in a broad sense per 100,000 the mental the the suicide rates amongst men is increasing and ha and has really increased dramatically since the early 2000s now in reality we're not seeing a stagnation in that um what what I do think we are starting to see a little bit more and and this is where I get a little bit biased because I see a lot of men in therapy largely because of my platform and men's mental health we are seeing more and more men coming to therapy. There's more diagnosis of mental health and mental illnesses um, amongst the male population. But in truth, on a, on a broad spectrum, there's still only a third of men that are, make up the population of people in therapy. Um, that in itself over the past few years has increased, but it's quite frightening. You know, I did a, I did a workshop recently on, on men's mental health for an organization and spoke about this, that like, you know, our awareness of the conversation is increasing conversations like this, but but some of those suicide, those suicide rates are not really shifting massively, which is pretty frightening. And, and I, I can't remember off the top of my head, it's like 78, 75% of suicide. Yeah, rates it's 70, 78% last time I, I understood. I think it was like 78% of, of people that take their own lives are men. Um, I mean, it, it, it's like, I don't remember the exact figures. I think it's 84 a week in the UK, men. Who die by suicide, which is a really, which is a really frightening statistic. Actually, when you think about it, yes, yeah. it's, it's you did a campaign a couple of years ago about with um, ITV News did a campaign on this, and they actually lined up. I can't remember how many a week it was then with men who die by suicide, but they lined up mannequins around the edge of their headquarters to kind of depict that. And it's just it's frightening when you see it, and and to, to understand those statistics, it's really really scary. Yeah, like. So in my head, the way that thought there, like the most clients I've ever had at one time was 60 people. And that was like a lot mm -hmm. to deal with. So to think then 20 more people, because I was having to deal yeah. with these people one-on-one -on -one, for the 20 more of yeah. them. Yeah. That number, that is like, like you say, it's, it's a scary, scary number. And it really is. There's, there's things that I kind of wanted to talk about. And there'll be questions that I'm going to ask that will be so big and difficult to answer. Um, like, do you have an opinion on potentially why this is going the way it's going or i think i think the first thing to say with that is that i'm going to speak like a classic psychologist and say that it's a it's a multi-dimensional problem for me there's a number of societal perspectives around being a man or manness that create challenges when it comes to understanding men's mental health dealing with it and getting actually men into therapy which for me is the biggest intervention so I, I, I think one of the key things that we have to understand is that every man is different and, and there's different ways in which people identify. There's people, there's different life stages, there's different experiences. Like for example, I do a lot of work in um, older men's mental health. And one of the things that we're finding for men in their kind of 60s, 70s, 80s is that there's a, there's a real disconnection from the mental health conversation. Actually, there's this kind of degendering where men are no longer seen as part of the male population, they're seen as the older population. So actually these kind of societal perspectives on what it means to be a man are still kind of weighing heavy, I think. And even, even the kind of societal connotations of who men are and how we identify men and, and what role men play in our society can be incredibly challenging for when men are experiencing severe anxiety or severe depression. And so it becomes very, very complicated very quickly. I also think therapy itself has a lot to answer for. I think therapy has been very good at saying men have to break down all these barriers of being a man in order to just come to therapy and talk to a psychologist. Actually, therapists and therapy need to do a much better job of accommodating male identity and understanding who men are. And actually, some of the research recently has been really interesting around therapeutic, like positive therapeutic outcomes. There's a big correlation between when therapy utilizes and understands some of those concepts of what it means to be a man and uses that in therapy as opposed to trying to destroy them. So... Yeah. I think society and, and therapy itself have to kind of understand a little bit about how we view men 
and that's got a big role to play with some of the suicide rates and mental health rates, I think. So this is a question that I ask, Scott, because, again, the reason I called my podcast Man is because I'm slightly obsessed with a couple of things like how to live a good life and then how to be a good man. Um, yeah. And you're talking, like, the mention there of therapy, and this is something that I read, and I'm not going to remember the exact numbers, but men actually say less words than women as well, don't they? Don't they? Yeah, yeah. Um, there's, there's, and also men there, have... Go on, you go for it. No, 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 it's okay. I was just going to tap into that because you're absolutely right. I mean, even on the communication patterns, men are just are not as good. We see that in, the, in young boys as well. Some studies have been done around kind of emotional processing and understanding. There's a really interesting study done in 2015, I think, where young boys were shown different faces and asked to describe what emotions were being shown. And they were like frighteningly worse than girls. Like young girls were fantastic at being able to understand different emotional faces, understand what emotions were. Boys were really, really poor at this. So both on a communication and emotional understanding level, boys are so not that, good at this. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. And this was like the, the other... Uh, like counselors and stuff that I've spoke to, they just kept saying we need to get men to talk, we need to get men to talk. And from what I'd read, like males' level of emotional intelligence is much lower than a female's. So if we don't even know how we're feeling, and then we say less words, it's it's, it's surely going to be it's such a difficult thing. But it's good to hear that there's more men going to therapy. Yeah, I I see it on my side, Thomas. I see it again. I think there is a there's a level of me being a little bit of an outlier there because of the standing I have in the men's mental health community. People see my content online, a lot of men connect with that and then want to work with me. So I see a large majority of men in therapy as a result of that. Um, but again, I think that's where I think that's where therapy needs to do a much better job is like instead of trying to get men to break down all these barriers of stoicism, self-reliance, all these kind of things, instead of breaking those down, how do we utilize those for positive therapy outcomes? And we need to get a lot better at that. I mean, so, and like this is maybe like way off topic and maybe doesn't completely relate to it, but then on the on just now, because I know we'll probably touch on social media and the impact that that's having, but there are there are people that potentially could be seen as helpful, but then they get a bad name. And, and again, I'm more wanting to hear like your yeah. kind of maybe a personal opinion, but people like Jordan Peterson, yeah. Uh, yeah is it is it adam tate andrew tate yeah andrew yeah like i've not seen much yeah. of his stuff because i think the first couple of things i've seen i was a bit like maybe if you said yeah. it in a different way it would be and then i think like, like gorgons yeah absolutely so like I, like the likes of andrew tate i mean there's an there's an intention there to be intentionally controversial and yeah. i've seen a bit of his stuff there's the stuff in that that's really pretty deplorable um I'm aware that things are cut up and edited and you can only see certain segments, but there's certain things that, but you think about like Jordan Peterson, I absolutely agree with you, you know, and one of the, this is where, this is where the topic gets so difficult, doesn't it? Because yeah. Jordan Peterson talks a lot about in one way or another, the men's mental health and, um, and he's been chastised a lot for some of the things he said. I actually think he's one of the most misunderstood people on earth in reality for a lot of things. Um, he makes a lot of really valuable points about autonomy, being a man, about mental health, about society as well. Um, but what he but what he he does talk about a lot is the kind of the alienization, the social disconnect of men and mental health and therapy and understanding men and the labeling of men and how we do that, the associations that we we frame around men as one group and not understanding mm. that there are many different forms of men within that. Um, and really what being a man means. So yeah, I, I agree. There's a number of figures on social media right now who, yeah, there's some that don't provide good content, but there's some who do really provide good content but are misunderstood. And I think Jordan Peterson definitely comes under that bracket. Yeah, I, I've got both his books. I've only read the first one. And I can remember just reading yeah, through it and being like, if you followed these rules, I was like, you'd probably be pretty content. Yeah, very Absolutely. I mean, he talked, it's interesting because like he talks even about like um, it's something I, I watched one of his lectures recently on um, men in their early 20s committing to a marriage and committing to a long-term relationship and how that's very against societal expectations or societal norms. But he talks about the benefits of that for young men growing up. And um, I actually really agree with that in a lot of ways, particularly when that's kind of very contrary to a lot of societal perspectives, perspectives on what men should be and do. 
Mm. Man, I think it's class. Like, I, honestly, it does fascinate me, and I could just keep like digging into that and just even just hearing about your opinion. I, I, I like that as well, and that's exactly what yeah. I want this to be. But I wonder, like, I kind of like want to revert back to the like the talking less and lower levels of emotional intelligence. And with you being like a professional, and and maybe like maybe there's people that don't fully understand what they're expected to do if they go to like therapy yeah. or group or anything like how do you kind of like work through that that's a great question actually and the, the way i the way i work through it is by when i have a man who comes to therapy the way i work through it is i recognize it's taken a heck of a lot for them to get here in the first place this isn't you know like when you think about all the stuff that you just said there thomas about like challenges with communication emotional processing emotional understanding those are all natural limitations that that man likely experiences. It's not always the case, of course, but in a broad sense, that's that's the case. So I want to, when I first walk, work with a man like that, I want to recognize that and kind of show I understand that this is not deemed as normal. I understand that coming to therapy as a man, seeing a man in therapy can feel really weird. And I'm asking you to talk about things that in reality, you've probably never spoken to about anybody. So, you know, I, I think there's, there's a real need to understand that. And I, and I also want to kind of reassure men a lot of times and say, I'm not here to make you spill your guts. I'm not here for you to break down in tears. If that's what happens, that's okay. That's absolutely fine. But you don't have to go, you don't have to be doing that in order for therapy to be helpful for you. And I think I see a lot in men, I don't know about your own experiences, but I see a lot of men who come to therapy and are quite scared of what I'm going to do, what I'm going to say, what I'm going to ask, and actually bringing a level of reassurance calming the situation a little bit is like the first step for me but building a trust with them too and i think you and i do that by establishing that understanding but really kind of building a bit of a relationship there and saying listen you can trust me to talk about this stuff here you know it's different in this therapy room is different to the outside world that's what i often say and um, i think it's really important to build that kind of relationship and that understanding so and you and you do that from the very initial stages yeah yeah because like, like an example I use, because one, one of the one of the therapists that I spoke to, she was a female, and like straight away she was like, we need to get men to talk more, we need to get men to talk more. And I was like, yeah. and I just, the first thing I said to her is like, people will see these kind of interactions, like the way we're doing just now, and we both, I'm, I'm the chattiest person on this planet, I'll talk to anybody. You know? <laughs> but if you get, say, like five or six blokes, stood even in yeah. a pub, bit of football yeah. on, there's no talking. Yeah, no. And maybe that's news to I, women to hear, like we don't, we don't, and we maybe say, no. aye, yeah, mm-hmm, yeah. Mm, ah. Like, I, I, I totally agree with you. Like, I think it's one of the issues I have. I don't know if you feel the same, but like some of these TV adverts that kind of, and they, did, they, they ran campaigns like about men's mental health or mental health in general. And there is sometimes it's just in this association, it's this insinuation that if men all sit down in a circle with one another, they'll immediately start um, opening up emotionally. And, and, it, and, it, and it just doesn't, it just doesn't happen. Um, not my, my not my direct experience anyway no. i mean i think and, and you know some of some of these kind of man groups or male groups can actually be really helpful when there's an intention or when it's skewed towards therapeutic benefits so for example like if you and i were experiencing depression as we both have and we were advised to go to like a men's support group we might find that more beneficial because there's an intention there for it to be therapeutic but if we're all in the pub together and we're watching the football, it's unlikely that men are going to open up like that. It's just, it just doesn't happen as much. Yeah. Do you find, and this is something that I also mentioned, like, because when I, when I approach them, they're like, how about you create a group or a club? Do you find that men prefer to come like one-to-one -one or would prefer to join? Because I personally wouldn't go to a club. I don't, I don't think I would join a club. Yeah. Do you know what? Personally, I don't think I would either. Um, well, that's that's maybe not so much true. I mean, maybe I would because it, it makes me think a lot about my, my my therapy training. We did a lot of kind of group work stuff, um, but I would find one to one interaction much much easier. I think that's maybe just my nature. I'm I'm much more. Yeah, kind that's of one -to -one. What I, was, I just as you said that there, I was like, maybe that's just my nature because I do one to one personal training. Maybe I'm just kind of like I'd lean yeah. towards that. Yeah, but not maybe. But I I do think there is something about men in groups. So like, it sometimes it's like you know when you're what what I do. What I do see as helpful is a lot, like, so I work with like recovering addicts and I work with people who have had addictions and for example, um, Alcoholics Anonymous can be really a useful tool for people in support. And there's a lot of men in that and that's a group setting. It's a very therapeutic group environment. And I think when, when that group has like a main focus, we're overcoming our alcohol addiction here. We're all here for therapeutic benefit. 
when there's a cohesive understanding, I think it's better. But I'm a, I'm like you. I do think men in general perhaps work better on an on a, an emotional level one to one. I think that's probably true. Yeah, and and I hope anybody listening listening doesn't think that we're saying that there it's not a place to go. Like I know there's no oh, absolutely groups that are doing fantastic things. I just often wonder yeah, that are. if like men would be put off and prefer. I don't I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'm probably what you describe. You make a good point. Yeah, no, you, you make a good point because I think when you're in a group, there's you're disclosing to more people. Sometimes that that feels quite risky, and that you're not as you don't have as much autonomy or control when you're with seven other people compared to when you're with one person. Um, mm-hmm. So I agree. I think there definitely there's a lot of groups really, really powerful and beneficial for all mental health, including men. We see some of them in Glasgow here, but I do wonder actually. I, I think it's the kind of thing I would advise. Like if if there's a man listening and it's like, gosh, I've been experiencing these mental health difficulties. I actually think the kind of first interaction would be like on a one-to-one basis. That would be really useful just to yeah. kind of see what that would be like. So yeah, but group work can always be useful in the future. <clears throat> I guess it could even be a thing for some men at the art could potentially be listening that they didn't know there was clubs or you could do it one-to-one and they didn't know they had the choice. Yeah. So yeah, like honestly, like, I know in, in our broth, just I think there's 23,000 people here. We we have um, Reach Across, uh, which is mm. an amazing place that's created like genuinely in the... It, it's just a brilliant place. We've got a place called Andy's Man Club that I'm sure that that's doing oh, pretty well. Um, and what I may do as well is actually I might actually like tag all them in below if you don't mind as yeah. well. I, I, of course, but, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I just that was always something that crossed my mind. But I, it's like mm. you say, it's going to be very, as you said earlier on, all men are different. It's going to be very. Yeah, they are. Dependent. Absolutely, you know, and everybody everybody has different experiences, and everybody has like. Their own mental health difficulties and maybe an idea of what would be useful i think i think again though like some of the conversation around how those therapeutic environments need to cater for men more and understand them I, again not to kind of throw too many statistics at people but i think like statistics can really help us understand the issue there was something that came out recently that um, men who, who die by suicide 65 percent of those men have tried to access help or access the wrong kind of help three months before they die and you think like we often have that kind of narrative. It's like, well, these men just aren't coming forward. Actually, there's a lot of men who are coming forward. It's that the support sometimes isn't there, or when they access the support, it's not the right kind of support. And I found that really scary recently. We have this narrative sometimes that men just aren't coming to therapy. A lot of the times they are coming to therapy, but they're really put off. And instead of saying right, well, men need to, men need to do better. To, to come to us actually no we need to do a lot better in, in, yeah, in coming to yeah. men and, and I don't know if it's point. just the way my brain sorry the way my brain works is like trying to think of like one in three or like a third of people in therapy are male we then have yeah. like a, such a high statistic of suicides being male to then like 65% did you say there son like of yeah. them tried to go like this is so my big thing when I was speaking with all these people is I was like there's there's maybe a different way, there's maybe mm. something that we're maybe missing and we obviously are because this mm. like this volume of people these volume of men, like and do you yeah. have any like I don't know like and I don't know if you can really talk about this with like your academic background is there anything that like that maybe be like a new approach or something that you, like it's just maybe even just an idea just something to like riff off like yeah that could I mean that would help for me. I don't know if it's so much about a new approach, but I, I think there's, I think it's how to word it best. I think there's something about catering therapeutic approaches to men, right? So, for example, one of the th- one of the reasons I started Get Side was it's mental health content that you can access on your phone and nobody needs to know about. It. That's fair. Now, I did that through the lens of. Men, although Get Sight is much more than just a men's mental health platform, there's a lot of content there on men's mental health. But I did that because I know that men are not likely to say to their partners or their friends, hey, by the way, I'm really experiencing depression here. Does anybody know a good therapist? They're unlikely to do that. What they're going to do is they're going to start scrolling on the phone. Yeah, they're going to start looking on the phone for help. They're going to start looking on the phone for advice. And I really wanted to put out the right kind of support. There's a lot of all kinds of different support and advice on the Internet. So what I think is we need to lean into that. Instead of saying, well, men need to just come to therapy and start talking, actually the, the way in which men access the support and help is like through their phones when they're sitting in the corner of the living room when their kids are playing with their toys on the living room floor. That's, that's where they access the support. 
the other ways as well is like sometimes they go and they go to the gym and they go work out or they're you know they, they'll do other things those are really healthy things but how are we meeting men there in a therapeutic yeah. sense a couple of years ago we did a, a million kilogram lift challenge at the gym that i ran sorry i ran the event at my gym um, and that was an aid of men's mental health because you know men are coming to that gym and it's helping a lot of men but sometimes the therapeutic environment and the, and the emotional environment is not there so by going to the gym and talking to men about it that was really beneficial and, and and having content that's accessible for that man themselves without having to talk to people about like oh i need to go to therapy or i need to go see my gp for antidepressants so i think it's less about creating a new approach but leaning into the stuff and the way in which men access support does that, does that kind of make sense oh 100 100 percent. yeah yeah it's like a different route to really the same that. solution almost you know because you will and i don't even want to, i don't want to call it bias but you will be like talk in therapy these are the things that are going to help but how do we get men there and how do we get them to like the right place that in fact if like 65 percent of them are trying to get there and it's not yeah. clicking no i it's, think it's, it's a massive problem yeah it's huge do you know and i and i think like what i said there i think those are the first steps and i think one of the things that's different with men is that it sometimes takes men months even years to initially get to therapy so yeah those kind of initial steps of like online content, kind of the right conversations in the right environments lead men to get to therapy eventually. They're far less likely to say, I've got a problem, I need to go to therapy. Yeah. Now, more and more we see that more men do that, do are, are doing that. At times I see men in therapy that do that. But we just, I think we just need to understand men a little bit more. And instead of saying, right, it's a man problem and they need to accommodate to us, Thera I'm talking about therapy, Therapy needs to say, we've got a problem here and how men are coming to us. We need to cater our approach a little bit. It's one of the issues I have with the men's mental health narrative in general, which is like terms like toxic masculinity, which I really, I really don't like because it insinuates that the, the problem is that these men are men. And that's the problem. It's that you're a man. It's not that there's lots of other things going on. And it's not that we can maybe cater and, and improve our approach for you. It's actually you're the one with the issue. So I think, I think there's some things in that are important. And that, and that there, that is like what I want this podcast to be. Like I want it to be, I want to get on like, I want to get on gay men. I want to get on like transgender. Yeah. I want to get black men yeah. on. I want to get like as many different men as I possibly can. Yeah. And, uh, and I want to talk to them about their experience of being a man and growing up and going through things. And I, I think that Absolutely. is like, like that's great. I honestly think it's like a fantastic point on like the difference and this like toxic idea. And it, the thing that I like about this, this toxic thing, and you spoke about it in your uh, in your TEDx video, that like growing up, I wasn't one of the hard blokes, and I was shit yeah. at football. Like, <laughs> I've been feel. like, I've not had very many fights, but I've been battered in all of them. Like, and, I was, <laughs> and, and honestly, <laughs> honestly, and like this is things that like people, like my mates, will take the mick out of me for. And I know yeah. they're not meaning to like yeah. demasculinize or demasculinate. No, demasculinate. no. They're not trying to like bring me down or anything, but they just like poke no. fun because it's still something that's yeah. there. And and I don't yeah. go out very I don't go out drinking very often. But when I do, there's in pubs, there's still that like, who's the hardest in the town? Who, could he take him? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And do you there's like, absolutely so? That. Do you think that stemmed from like, and I, these are this is gonna be like a bit of a wild question. Is there like a time, or do you think that's like a hunter gatherer, alpha like from like the beginning like, of time? It's a really cool, interesting point. You know, I listen, I think biologically there is a competitive, aggressive trait in men. Um I think I think largely on a kind of evolutionary biological level that exists. To say that doesn't exist, I don't think is accurate. Um now of course that doesn't exist in all men and plenty of women have those traits as well. But I think those elements really are part of, of what make up men. Now, those are one of the challenges with that is that those are traits that can be executed in really unhealthy ways. And even today we see that as well. Like, yeah, I know what it's like. You go to a bar and it's like, well, who's the biggest guy here? Or, you know, who's who's giving who's looking and staring and you know and you, you see that kind of thing kick off. Yeah. There's almost like a kind of a territorial um pride 
uh, masculine thing that goes on there. Now, you could definitely make the argument that says that that's a million miles away from a man sitting in a therapy chair talking about his emotions. There's no denying that. Yeah. I do think I do think there's also I don't know about like for you growing up, Thomas. Like you kind of alluded to it a little bit there, but it was kind of similar for me that like your identity as a man was very much made up of like, how many fights you could win or how good you were at football. And I was neither of those things, much like you. And um, yeah. so therefore, your identity as a man is like is is zero. And those are those were things I think particularly for people at our age, growing up and older as well. It's like those are concepts that make up what a man is. And, and, and they can be really destructive and detrimental, but we even see you play it in today's world, I think, too. Yeah, no, I, I do. I totally, and, I, and I've got a couple, like, a couple friends that are a bit more like me, and I, I don't know if that's described as like a cosmopolitan man. Is that what that's called? Like, it's not it like... Be. yeah. I, yeah. Like, I'm not sure if that is like the term, or like, I don't know if that's, I don't, I don't know. I don't know, and if that's on PC or upsets anybody, I, I, I apologize, it's just my ignorance. Um, but yeah, like I've got a friend, and we speak about it sometimes. Like we won't bump into one and be like, "Oh, did you see football last night?" Yeah. Like I can yeah. hold that conversation, but I've had to learn to do that. Yeah, you know, it's like, a kind it's, of trick. Not- yeah, absolutely. It's a kind of absolutely. It's the kind of thing that, and and again, and I know what this is like. Like when when people ask you about like football, and you don't know, is this, this kind of recoil, or when you don't have a team that you support. Yeah. And then I have to have that, like you have had to have, I have that conversation about, oh, I, I played basketball my whole life, but I don't really follow football. You get that kind of like recoiled response that, well, that's, that's not, that can't be right. You know that? So, so I, I think, I think actually it really does play into this. It's like, it's part of that narrative. Like there's a way to be a man. And if you're, if you're not that stuff, then you're, then what are you? So yeah. it's, it, it can, it can be quite, it can get very complicated pretty quickly in how we identify men through that stuff. Yeah, and I'm going to have to pull back, actually, and talk again about, like, when I'm saying I want to get gay man on, black man, trans, like, all these things, mm. that's not because they're, like, not what I think would be a man. It's because I think no. there is, like, like you say, like, a huge spectrum of men, and I want, Absolutely. hopefully, young men to listen to this, totally. to then see, like, oh, shit, actually, I'm a bit like him. Absolutely. He seems like a good guy. I totally agree with that. I think I think that's a really really good point and an angle to, to to pitch so much of this from because, and not to use annoying words, but like, men are not one homogenous group. We talk about homogeneity no. in our in our in our therapeutic uh, research. It's not like okay, it's not men's mental health. It's like there's many different men. There's so many different kinds of men, and all have their different experiences. And some of these kind of um, objective general terms that we're using for men don't apply to every man and that's appropriate as well they're still men they're still experiencing some of these challenges they're still but 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 everybody has a different experience like i think in, in many ways what's quite interesting is you and i have quite a similar experience there'll be some men that you'll interview that have totally different experiences to you or i and that's totally appropriate as well so I think that's one of the things that we've got mixed up in our societal perspectives about men's mental health as well as we think these are men so these are the problems they're facing well that's not really the case because actually there's lots of different men within that group that experience something totally different and we don't always look at it through that lens yeah and and we spoke about so i am going to ask this question because we've seen we've said like these are men and these are men and i'm going to ask it because but and lisa she'll be shaking because i said to her i was like lisa i want to ask him this but i don't know how to word it and i am going to try and word it as carefully as i possibly can like yeah. you and, and i'm i'm actually i'm just going to shift the blame onto you no i'm, I'm joking i'm not <laughs> in 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 your in your talk again because mate, honestly that talk i love it and i'm maybe going to sound like an echo chamber yeah. because i loved it so much and i'm very biased to everything that you say in it. like there is a part in it that you talk about men like are kind of seen as predators and yeah. there's men that do all these horrible things and what people are doing is yeah. like they're saying like this is what men do whereas we kind of had a quick yeah. chat before is like I want to see it as like there's males but you yeah. earn the right to call yourself a man and like yeah, anybody can identify as a man or as a male sorry but you then earn yeah. the right to become yeah. a man mm. and you mentioned as well yeah. there's like and I, and again I don't really know fully where I'm wanting to go with it and I don't even know if I do want to ask you a question about it because it's a hard, It's going to be a hard well, thing to answer, but I think it's well, just something that could turn into a conversation. And I, I guess we could, I could pull from it, like with you looking at so much research. Maybe there's nothing on this, and maybe it's a, like an original idea. Yeah. And if it is, I'd be very proud of myself. But I wonder if there's yeah. ever been research on like the change of role models for men. 
In what sense? I mean, not not to my knowledge directly, but I think like, are you talking about how role models have changed more in recent years, perhaps? And yeah, maybe, potentially from like, yeah. I don't know, like the idea of when, I don't know, I don't know if social media has had a massive impact. I don't know if like, yeah. like the people that were getting more regular uh, exposure to were yeah. seen as like, oh, that's who yeah. I want to be, as opposed to maybe just like, there was a lad up the street that used to help more people, or or even like people looking yeah. towards their dads and be like, oh, that's yeah. that's my hero. Do you know like? Yeah, I totally agree with you. I, I think I think social media has a big role to play in that. I think one of the conversations that we used to have, or I still have, is like, see, like, in the 50s, 60s, prior to that, even later as well, people used to have to fight in order to get their voice heard. They used to have to publish their research, which was a scrupulous process. They used to have to be elected, or they used to have to... Now anybody with an opinion can, can quite quickly communicate that to millions of people. And, and that, first of all, can be a good thing in many ways as people have more liberation and freedom in their speech and access to that but it can also be a massive challenge because anybody can spout anything and it's one of the it's one of the things that i i really struggle on social media as well is that sense of of, of manliness which is so often around um like muscle stature or or yeah. like number of sexual partners um and that kind of stuff is really communicated heavily and I, and I really, really get my back up about that because I think so much about being a man is about establishing a sense of responsibility, establishing accountability, um, establishing respect and support. And I think all of those things often kind of fly in the face. I mean, for example, one of the things that, that we're seeing in young men right now is, um, I won't go into too much of the detail of it, but I had a, a colleague who found this in her research years ago, that, that we're seeing more and more eating disorders within boys under the age of 16. We never, we never saw that in the 90s. We never saw that in the 90s. It was never a thing. It was eating disorders and the way in which bodies are affected was a thing that was reserved for women. That was eating disorder, anorexia and bulimia and huge issues that are still ongoing. But we're seeing more and more boys going to doctors and coming to therapy for, for body dysmorphic issues. I mean, we use that term bigorexia. But it's, it's, it's genuinely a case. Men who throw their marriages and their families in, in, away in order to pursue more sexual partners like that's that's what we're kind of seeing as our role models now and for me that's really quite frightening um, and i and i would blame a lot of social media on that actually yeah so that kind of leads me again like honestly I, i'm and the thing that's worrying me is like i'm hoping that it's not just like i'm just agreeing and agreeing and agreeing but it's, it's very similar to no. how i feel about a lot of these things yeah and i'm gonna go like because i don't want to upset anybody i genuinely don't but this idea of like you can be born male, you can identify as a male, but becoming a man is like earned. And I, and yeah. like, I think that's like a status. Like you can't just call yourself a millionaire. You have to have. I can, I, yeah, I can see your perspective on that because, do you know, I, I, in part I agree because I think, you know, there's, there's attributes that, um, it's like, it's like being a dad compared to being a father, you know, it's like, 100%. or a father to a man. Like, you can have a child and be a, be a father, but it, but it takes, takes a number of different attributes and intentions to be a dad and that's weird because that's what lisa spoke to me about this morning when i said like how do i talk about this like male versus yeah. man thing and, and there's kind of two branches on this that i want to talk about and one of them we'll talk about uh, i'll just ask now like so see when you hear the saying like man up mm. the way i see that saying is like if we could get it so that there's like male and then there's like men if yeah. we're talking about like manning up, we're talking about like doing the things that these men, these like figures that we should look up to, not just yeah. like, oh, you need to be masculine. It's like, yeah. maybe it is like you said there to like take, maybe it means just like, let's take a bit of responsibility. Let's, yeah. let's, let's earn some respect. Let's yeah. do those things, I, like I, the I, man I, things. But I know absolutely. it's the saying that like people hate. And I, I they do. Wonder, and, I guess, and, 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 and I, yeah, no, I, they do, and I think because it's, and I do too in some ways because it has those kind of connotations where it's like, well, just stop complaining or just stop talking about it or just stop crying about it. And actually, yeah. those things are not in line with being a man. Whereas no. be, being a man has got to do, I think, in, in part, not always, of course, but in part, some of it has to do with accountability, responsibility, um, you know, those, those self reliance, these kind of things to a degree, not fully, of course, but. But those things are part of, of, of being a man. And and I think like, you know, I think it is important to kind of have that conversation about actually what does it mean to be 
a man? What does that actually mean for, for people? And of the, the different kind of men that, you know, that identify as, as, as men, what does it mean to them to be a man? And, 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 and what qualifies that? You know, and I think the kind of father-dad comparison is a good example of that. Um, yeah, I'm going to have to remember that because that like almost seems like I'm not prejudicing or I'm not like, do you know, like I like, I'd really do like that example. Absolutely. No, I don't think so. Either. It's, a, it's a complex topic. It's a really difficult topic. Yeah. Yeah, and I, again, I'm gonna have to come back. Like, I do not want to upset anybody. Like, I accept everybody for everybody. I've actually got a T-shirt with the pride flag on it because I want it to Magic. be because that stands for being you, no matter what. Yeah. And the T-shirt's mm. called "Be You" because I want people to yeah. more likely be themselves and push to be themselves mm. as opposed to trying like mm. um, conform and be like what they think they're supposed to be like. Mm. Um, so the idea, like, I'm gonna come back to the sentence. I know you're got. I've got to get you off, so I will try and wrap up pretty quick. So this idea of like man up, like I know that people they get scrutinized and people try and pull away from it. But in the same time, if you think, and you'll have experienced this, you're on the street, there's two men about to fight each other. Someone will say, be the bigger man. And they're meaning just like make the right choice. But then is that like a wrong, and I guess you're not going to be able to answer this because it's, but like this is why I think if we could like have a better understanding of what we, as even just a society and not masculinize yeah. this like toxic masculinity, like we understand that like mm -hmm. men should be like more uh, role models. Men should be proud to be a man. Yeah. Like, yeah. does that make sense? Yeah, well? absolutely. So, like, I think I, I think that example is quite interesting because like yeah, be the bigger man means to kind of walk away from that. I think in part as well, it it it, it means for me in a situation like that that don't feel like it's not about needing to beat up another man in order to establish your manliness. Like, yeah. if you need to do that, there's real problems, I think, with your understanding of what it means to be a man and also maybe your own male identity. And that's that's a challenging one because I do think, you know, when a man is maybe in a situation like that, it's the same for many people, women as well, I'm sure, that when they're in a situation like that, your ability to walk away and to be responsible and accountable is, is, is a really key part of a male identity instead of just beating the absolute crap into the guy in front of you. Um, which we'll have seen, you and I have seen many times before. So, do you know, it, it, it's where it kind of gets really complicated because, yeah, you're right, that term issue is like be the bigger man, walk away. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, honestly, I do. And, I, and these are just things, mate, my mind just goes, eh? Like, I, I can be thinking about this stuff and I'll, I'll think about things after, no doubt. Like, I know, yeah. and I'm, I'm, I probably will reach out and ask some questions. And the, that's, the, like, the other thing to add to like this idea of, like, man and being a man is, like, I was brought up, and like, if you, if you, honestly, if you ever met my dad, my dad is like an old-fashioned gentleman. Yeah. And you touched on as well that like something that I feel like there was things that I was brought up to do, like, like if a girl needs like if a, if a female or a woman's needing seen up the road, like mm -hmm. you would walk her up the road, yeah. no, like I would have no bad intentions. Um, no. Holding a door open for a female, like I know they can do it themselves, but it was kind of like how I was brought yeah. up. Um, yeah. Also, like a thing that started to recently, like start to happen is, uh, and you mentioned it as well, like in your talk about, like you worry a bit about what a woman's thinking. Like if I'm walking home and it's dark and I'm on the same side of the street as a, as a female, I'll probably yeah. cross because I know it'll make her feel a bit more comfortable yeah. if I get out of her yeah. way. Yeah. And I, I yeah. guess I, I don't know if there's things on there that I'm said because I don't really know what I want to ask. But I, th I think I think you make some interesting points though because it, it speaks to a. To, to what I think is called a male cognitive bias in people, which is that, and we find this a lot in kind of male identity, is that when the identity of men, which we do see in mainstream media more so right now, is that of an aggressor and a predator. And listen, first of all, I want to caveat this by saying men are responsible for 95 to 96% of violent crimes in our country, right? So there's an issue going on there. Right, so men are, men are doing something. This isn't. I'm not saying. Oh no, this stuff isn't actually happening. Of course, it's happening. Yeah. And men absolutely have to hold themselves to more account. And we have to understand what's going on there. And I actually think even the conversations that you and I are having, Thomas, is about that. It's about having those conversations about men and what that means. Because without these conversations, we don't have a sense of identity. And I actually think there's more risk, more risk of this stuff happening. So, but but when we have that identity as well, it's men that are the problem. We therefore have this cognitive bias that say, well, they also can't be victims. If men are predators and if men are um, criminals and if men are attackers, they can't be victims at the same time. So when men are experiencing mental health difficulties in society right now, we view men as predators. That means they can't be victims. So going to therapy 
and talking about your mental health and your emotions doesn't fit with that narrative that we impose on men right now. Again, caveat in the realities that, of course, men need to account for themselves more and we need to hold men to a higher standard like that. But we, we need to get into a society of recognition that, yes, 96% of violent crimes are conducted by men. That's a problem and we need to address it. But lots of men can also be victims in that and say, you know, men can also experience mental health difficulties. So I think we see it very black and white. And actually, it's multiple shades of grey. That cognitive bias thing, I think, is happening quite a lot right now. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah, and that's really interesting. That is really, really yeah. interesting. And I and I, I agree. And that's part of like what's forced. Like it was kind of like the final straw to like push. Like right, look, I need to just do this podcast so I can get people to talk to see that there's a bunch of different men. We're just not all this yeah. one predator, as we'll say, or yeah. like we're not all we're bad. Right. Like we're not we're not all of no. us want these terrible things to happen or anything. Yeah. Um, and I guess like I've got two questions, and we will I will let you get going if you have time. Um, one you'll be able to answer really quick, and then the second one would be like, or the first one would be like, from your perspective, like say there are some guys that are, uh, they are listening, uh, and they're maybe a bit worried, or they still feel they're too early to come to therapy or to come to a group. Is there things that you could recommend that could potentially just slightly improve? And I know that's such a broad thing because there's so many things. Is there things that you maybe recommend taking out of your life, or maybe trying to increase or introduce? Yeah, I, I would. Um, the first thing that comes to my mind is, is establishing a sense of routine. Um, that sounds really boring, but actually one of the things that is very conducive for people with really severe anxiety and really severe depression, both men and women, is that they lack routine a lot of the times. And see, a lot of our routines come from like our sleep cycles. Really, really addressing things like sleep can be can take mass. It can be a massive impact on our well being. Making sure we get enough of that, but also sticking to quite a regimented way of this is when I go to bed and this is when I wake up even over the weekends. Diet, for me, is a massive one also. You know, when we increase um, high processed sugars and when we increase um, uh, certain forms of fat, like that that can have a big impact on our mood. And when we start to reduce that or we start to cut out or replace that appropriately, you'll mo know much more about that than I do, Thomas. But that, that, I know from the research, can be very impactful as well. And I think, like, for me, I'm a huge believer in physical activity. <laughs> And and for me, that's that's always been an incredible. That's been a massive part of my life. You know, one of the I and I'm by the way when I talk about this, I'm not a guru, but one of the biggest things that has been beneficial to my mental health is I wake up very early each day and I go to the gym before I do anything. I work out and then I have my day ahead of me. I have my evenings to spend with my family. I have my weekends to spend with my family. That routine for me has been central to my mental health. So I just think addressing little things like that done all together can make a big change. Yeah, people, right, and everybody that's listening, I didn't pay him to say all that because anybody that's no. <laughs> that heard me say all of those things week in, week out. So, and again, and I, I can like routine. You want to have some sort of routine, so there's almost like a purpose and a bit of structure. You want to improve your sleep. You want yeah. to improve your diet slightly. Exercise a little bit, and then there yeah. was another one. Um, I think you might cover them with those four actually. Yeah, so those, those, are, those, are the key things. So, those are definitely the key things for me anyway, yeah. Yeah, uh, so, right, I, I, this is how I'm going to be finishing every single podcast episode, and you did touch on this a little bit. What do you think makes a good man? Wow, for me, I think it's about um, being accountable. I think it's about being respectful as well. Um, what makes a good man is about... Um, Understanding the role that you play in society, and 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 understand be, being a man understand is about understanding those that rely on you. I think um, that you need to rely on yourself as well, and and holding yourself to account in order to be responsible for those people. You know, I think for me, being a father has really taught me about being a man, somebody that I'm responsible for, that I have to account for my actions impact this person's life. And that, for me, that's a really central thing about being a good man. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Fraser, honestly, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much pleasure, for your man. time. And I genuinely think if we can, if you have time, we should get on another yeah. time, chat again. Love and to. we can talk about a million different things. I'd love to do that, man. Thank you so much for having me. No, honestly, thank you. Thank you very much.